Greetings. I think it's time for another year. Unbelievably, the 10th season, which even looking back, I was talking about earlier, and except for you know, being a part of my immediate family that I didn't have much to do with, I don't think I've done anything for 10 years. <laughs> except I've worked at Nunez a little bit longer than that, but moves or marriages or had children or anything like that, this is about the longest thing I've ever done, which I don't know, it's kind of sad or kind of, <laughs> kind of something. So, but it, it's an amazing to think back when we started just that kind of ragtag on a shoestring, not sure what would happen, but a bunch of the people in here have kind of stayed with us this whole time, and, and it's just pretty amazing what, what we've come to. And this 10th season is going to be great. We're going to look back with a little bit of nostalgia, as is okay with the history series, and a lot of our speakers are going to be people who've been the most popular speakers who've been with us over the last decade. And uh, even a greater bit of nostalgia, at least to me, but I, I guess I'm biased, is to look back in, with our mascot. So I'll probably choose to look back at some of the best times over the 10 years, along and along this season with the different lectures. But what I wanted to do right now is to show the end product. And for those of you who are new to it, our mascot, Chloe, who is you know, I had nothing to do with the choosing of her for the mascot. You realize that. It was all independent and objective. <laughs> she is now seven years old, which means she, she's she been the mascot for even longer than she's been living. And so it's pretty much been with us the whole time. It's kind of grown with the season, been a good symbol. So the, her, the new thing is she's in the second grade. She just turned seven. She loves school and everything. The new part is she has glasses and she likes them, which I was glad of. And she has different kinds, some more fashionable than the other. All right, next slide, please. And her latest thing is rock climbing. And so that shows she's a, a little bit fearless, which I like, but her mom doesn't so much. All right, next slide. All right, so if you can see, that's my head down there, and that's her way up there. So she's a this is our latest activity, but very safe and, and very good. So anyway, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for tonight. He is uh, Ron Chapman, who's now a full professor of history at Nunez Community College, just promoted. Very cool. He's our most beloved and most frequent speaker over the decades. And um, he's gonna have a great and very topical lecture tonight that I think it'll be the first of many celebrations coming up over the next year of the Bicentennial of Louisiana Statehood. And it's a very interesting history as well. So it's a perfect combination of speaker and topic. And welcome to our 10th season and, and enjoy. Greetings all, it's a pleasure seeing you all here. It's been a little bit of a technological adventure today. You know, so we'll see how my little rat works. <laughs> it's been giving us a little bit of a problem. Uh, Louisiana uh, statehood is, as we'll get into this lecture, is totally different from any other state of the union. Most states just generally just came into the union, met the basic requirements of the ordinance of 1787 went through Congress, adopted the Constitution, and became a state. Not surprisingly, it was a little different for Louisiana. We charted our own little individual course. Let's see if I can, Nick, I may need a hand there. This is just a picture of our beloved state, and there are a few, so you can see the Red River coming down, and over here you have the Mississippi Plain uh, down here. And uh, next up, Nick, I think this thing's gonna, oh, go back to mine. When the Union was established, this Northwest Territory here, if you notice it's east of the Mississippi River, was about as far as they expected America to go. So before the Constitution was developed in 1787, the Continental Congress passed an ordinance which established the process whereby new territories would become states. Okay, they figured it would relate to this particular area here. They weren't anticipating a a country that would extend midway across the Pacific Ocean and into the Arctic Circle. Trust me. So this was all new for them. 
The process of becoming a state was quite simple. First, you had to have a population of over 60,000 people. Having accomplished that, you'd have one delegate of every 1,200 people. They would meet a convention, and they would decide whether or not they wanted to be a state. Following that, these delegates would then get together and come up with a means of drawing up a constitution. That constitution had to be consistent with the United States Constitution. Following that, and that having been done, they would then take their constitution, go before Congress, and request to become a state. It would be presented to the House, from the House to the Senate, from the Senate to the President's desk, signature, done deal. Except in Louisiana. Oh, we surprised. First thing uh, is that Louisiana was faced with a lot of opposition for a lot of reasons. First, Louisiana is the first state west of the Mississippi River to be brought into the Union. This caused a lot of consternation because the Louisiana Purchase had taken place in 1803. It's a vast bit of territory. It's basically doubled the size of the nation. So the concern was just exactly how many states can be carved out of here. Also, this is an area that's not part of that original group of a territory that was given to the United States as a result of the Treaty of Paris, 1783, that ended the American Revolution. We're now reaching beyond that. I mean, is that something we want to do? So you can imagine how Congress is divided today. You can imagine it's always been that way. Right. There we are. Also, Louisiana had no fixed borders. Every other state that came into the Union, you basically knew what its borders were. Louisiana did. You know, when the Louisiana Purchase took place and uh, Livingston met with Napoleon and talked about it, he says, well, what are the western borders? And Napoleon shrugged his shoulder and says, you got what I got. Well, what did you get? I never did figure that out. You just get what I got. Do you want it or don't you? Yeah, we'll take it. But nobody really knew what the western border was. The other problem was West Florida. Those of you who don't know, when the Treaty of Paris was signed, the 31st parallel, everything east of the Mississippi River and the 31st parallel, all of Florida was consulted West Florida was Spanish territory. So all of a sudden the question is, what about West Florida? We'll get into that a little bit later on, the controversies it starts. So when Louisiana enters the Union, it doesn't have fixed boundaries. So how do you bring something into the Union that you don't even know what it is? So that again is almost typical. Louisiana didn't have any democratic traditions. We had been under French and Spanish kings, unlike the rest of the states, which are basically an outgrowth of British common law and the British traditions of democratic government. We never had that. Some will argue that we're still kind of missing on that point. Louisiana was law, was Napoleonic. It wasn't based on the British uh, common law, which is another factor to consider. Louisiana was Catholic. Everybody else was Protestant. This was a very serious concern. Those of us who remember the 1960 presidential election with Jack Kennedy remember just how controversial a Catholic president was. Images of Popism and all this stuff were at his head. So you can imagine what it was like back then when these were some pretty raw nerves. People here spoke with a foreign tongue. They were Spanish and they were French. They just didn't fit in. So you start adding this all up together. Then New Orleans, New Orleans was like Babylon. It was just Sin City. I mean, to this day, how many people come to an LSU game in New Orleans and beat it out of town before the sun sets? Because you know, they just don't want to be here. I mean, New Orleans had that reputation, and back then especially had that reputation because it was a poor town with all the cane tucks, as they called them, coming down the Mississippi River for the trade. So it was a rowdy, rowdy city. And, and perhaps more interesting than anything else was the issue of the free black population. Mary Gaiman has a great book called Free People of Color in New Orleans, which I strongly suggest everyone to read. It's good because New Orleans was different. Louisiana was different. It was French and Spanish in its traditions, not English, and the attitudes towards African Americans and slavery was completely different. We had a very large free black population that played an integral part in the economy. Some of them owned slaves themselves. They had rights. The rest of the country couldn't comprehend this concept at all. And we'll find that that's going to create a bit of a problem. Oops, I got ahead of myself there. Louisiana was different. I think that kind of sums up everything else. 
you get right down to it. So, and the other issue was, should any new states be admitted from beyond the original boundaries set by the Treaty of Paris? This caused a lot of consternation, just think about it. You have two senators from each state and representation based upon population. Every time you add a state, the power of the existing states is diluted. They were willing to accept the 13 original colonies, the addition of a few more states in that little knuckle of territory in the extreme Northwest. But if you start taking everything that Louisiana acquired in the Louisiana Purchase and start carving that into states, how many states are you gonna have? How small is my influence in government gonna be if I'm from Massachusetts or Rhode Island or any of these other states. This is a matter of serious consideration for politicians. Louisiana Purchase is at the heart of all of this. I seem to be whistling. Generally now. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase, the United States vast, gained a vast amount of territory, nearly practically doubled its size, but the process wasn't as smooth as you would imagine. You know, everyone thinks that everybody welcomed, oh great, Jefferson brought Louisiana and it was nice and smooth and everyone was happy. It wasn't the case. A lot of places were concerned, again, in the Northeast. They felt that Louisiana was wrong simply because Jefferson did not have the constitutional right to buy more property, extend the size of the Union, and incorporate that. Furthermore, he certainly didn't have the right to double the national debt in the process of doing that. This is coming from a conservative. This kind of rings another bell, doesn't it? Also, you have the issue of England. England was upset because even though the transaction was financed by English banks, the money that was transacted, Napoleon gained and used it to build armies that he fought England with. So as a result, they weren't happy about this at all. As for Spain, Spain was literally upset because they said, wait, we own Louisiana. Napoleon traded us Tuscany for Louisiana. He never gave us Tuscany because he never owned it in the first place. And then he sold it. It's stolen property. We want our land back. Okay, so the whole issue of Louisiana was a bit in turmoil at this point in time. Okay, furthermore, what about West Florida? What's the story there? I mean, how does that fit in? Jefferson was convinced, oh, West Florida, that's part of the Louisiana Purchase. Spain said, I don't think so. I don't like the whole transaction anyway, much less I'm not gonna give you more property. So you can see there's a lot of territorial questions and political questions and legal questions and financial questions tied up with the Louisiana Purchase, but there's something else in the Louisiana Purchase. This, by the way, is an interesting map. If you look at it, this is an original map of, uh, I don't know if this thing's showing up, it's kind of dim, huh? but of the Louisiana Purchase, one of the first maps. The problem is this little area here is West Florida, so you can see, well, that's not part of Louisiana. You only refer to weather to the Florida parishes, that's what they're referring to. But if you look at the western boundary, it looks like it's a Sabine River, but it cuts pretty far inland and then goes back out again. This is another map done at about the same time. They don't know where the western boundary is. Here they have it at the Sabian River, and here they have it at the Rio Grande with little hedge marks on it. They got no clue. You know, so that was one of the fundamental problems you've got, is there's two boundaries, and here you see the West Florida cut off. So technically, Louisiana is this little narrow area here with a question as to whether or not where that particular border is going to lie. Also, which complicates things, because there's a lot of people in Congress that say, no, there's no way we're not gonna allow Louisiana to be a state. But when the Louisiana Purchase was drawn up, Napoleon had included Article Three, which said the inhabitants of ceded territory shall be incorporated into the Union of the States and admitted as soon as possible according to principles of the federal constitution. To not allow Louisiana to become a state violates the Louisiana Purchase. So that becomes another legal problem. So you can see how complicated this is getting like a Russian novel, which is not surprising. Then you've got another issue, the territory of Orleans. Once it was established in the, in the ceremony on December 20th, 1803, almost immediately, Congress got together and carved it up. They took the territory of Orleans, which is the present state of Louisiana. Everything else they took away and called it the District of Louisiana later calling it the Missouri Territory. They did this by a vote of 66 to 21. Oops, got ahead of myself again. 
Madison then appointed Claiborne to be governor, and the local representatives, local people, were horrified. You just carved this up. They figured Louisiana would be Louisiana. How could you carve us into pieces like this? I mean, what's going on in this Congress? So you can see where the politics is entering it again, okay? This then is what comes out of it, where here you have the territory of Louisiana minus West Florida, questionable border here, but here's the basic state, and all of the rest of this then becomes the Missouri Territory. William Clark, by the way, becomes governor of that area. Problems with Louisiana's western boundary. This is an interesting map. It shows West Florida here. They put a symbol on the side and explain the territory. I don't know where the boundary is. So they just put a, an applique on the side. <laughs> Forget that. Okay. The western boundary between Spain and the territories was heavily in dispute. The Spanish said it was at a royal hondo, which is like a dry gulch outside of Natchitoches. The United States said it was at the Sabine River. I think maybe the Rio Grande. They kept moving it further and further west. Spain and the United States in 1805 was on the verge of warfare over exactly what was going to happen, where that boundary was going to be, because negotiations had broken down. And of all people who comes along, who's one of the more interesting characters, there it is, General Wilkinson. This guy is a famous American general and also a Spanish spy. So it worked out well because he's the one that had to come up with an agreement. He was in the pay of both sides. So he comes to the strange conclusion that what he will do is put in a neutral strip between the Sabine River and the Royal Hondo, which would belong to neither one. Well, actually, it becomes a haven for criminals because since it didn't belong to anybody, there was no law there. So as a result, this area becomes a bastion for criminal activity. Okay, so this is what you got in Louisiana in 1805. Interestingly, you have counties. The parish system under the Spanish for a period disappears. So you have all these counties. This area here in black here is West Florida. It's not part of it. This area here is the neutral ground that Wilkinson carved out. So that is the territory of Orleans and it's divided into counties. We, by the way, are in Orleans County. So you can see the different ones. Come on. There. Problems with Spain and West Florida. Now let's go on the other side, okay? On West Florida issue, you have a variety of different things happening. First of all, when he purchased Louisiana, Jefferson was 100% convinced that West Florida was part of the deal. In fact, he thought the only deal was Florida. It wasn't until he got back that he said, what? I, I thought I was getting Florida and New Orleans. No, you got everything but Florida. You got all of New Orleans and Louisiana. Take it or leave it, is what Napoleon told him, so he did. However, that area there, Jefferson still thought was his, and that's going to kind of be an interesting story in itself, because that feeling on his part persists, okay? Everything east of the Mississippi River, but below the 31st parallel, excluding the Isle of Orleans, remained in Spanish hands. Okay? What happened is, these people in Spain became restive. It was Spanish territory, the Spanish government was pretty corrupt, and the Napoleonic Wars were going on at this time. They were looking at democracy now starting to flourish in Louisiana. They wanted to be part of it. Remember now, this is Baton Rouge, this is Manchac, everything above the lake is in Spanish territory, okay? That's the area we're talking about. When Napoleon invades Spain and arrests and seizes Ferdinand the Seventh, it creates an international crisis for the people here because suddenly they're French territory. Does that mean the British can invade and take them? That, coupled with the fact that they were angry with what was going on with Napoleon, and then also with the corruption of the Spanish government, they decided to hold a revolution. The first one is actually a little comical, okay? This is, oh, going back, this is the area of West Florida we're talking about. You're saying it's north of the lakes. This is the Isle of Orleans. This is the Liberville River and the lakes here. This is the Isle of Orleans right here. Everything here above the Liberville River, east of the Mississippi River, below here, this is all West Florida, part of Spanish territory. The Kemper brothers decided they were going to rebel. These are just two guys who just got a wild dime, you know, had a little bit too much rum, I guess, and decided they were going to form in a revolution. 
So what they do is they decide they're gonna attack the Spanish militia, they arrest a guy who's a Spanish accolade. As a consequence, you know, it causes a bit of a disruption. They're immediately arrested, they made their own flag, they went to Baton Rouge, they get themselves arrested after some of the local planners turn them in. Later, one of the Kemper brothers found one of the planners that turned him in, cut his ears off, and put him in a bottle of rum and put it on a bar where they had their bar. The other guy was so afraid, he ran away and ended up dying in a boat of exposure in the wintertime. That was the 1804 Kemper Rebellion in West Florida. But it failed, but they did get a flag. You know, they made their own little flag and put it up. When you get to 1810, you now have something serious happening where the people in West Florida are so angry they overthrow the government and they establish the Republic of West Florida. Okay, it's a legitimate government. They celebrate the victory, they announce the victory, they, they write a Declaration of Independence based on the American Declaration of Independence in September 26, 1810. The first General Assembly shall meet at St. Francisville on the third Monday of November and they shall choose a governor. They are literally setting up a government, okay? It becomes a separate nation. So try to imagine West Florida as a totally separate nation. And of course, if you have a nation, you got to have a flag. So there it is. So if you ever drive it down Interstate 12 and you'll see this blue thing with a star on it, now you know what it means. Also, if you're driving down Highway 61 and you see the big water tower, you'll see this, this symbol on it. What that is, that's the flag of the Republic of West Florida that existed for 74 days. That's about it, you know. This is all, I know, like I said, it's a Russian novel. It's all gonna come together, crazy, but all these little leads that put out there are gonna kind of turn around themselves and focus back on top, okay? Oh, back. This, this is a place I planned all over me. One more. So this is the area that we're talking about again. This is West Florida. Claiborne, when he hears about the rebellion, the people involved in the rebellion want to be part of the United States. That's, that's their fervent dream. But they've established themselves as a separate country. So as a result, their fervent desire is to meet with the representatives of the United States and go through the formal process of transferring power over to the United States and being absorbed. Claiborne doesn't see it that way. He immediately goes up and meets with Madison. They sit down and talk about it. And uh, what you end up with is an interesting document where, where is the territory south of the Mississippi and east of the Mississippi and extended the Petito River of which possession was not delivered to the United States in pursuance of the treaty concluded in April of three, has at all times, it is well known, been considered and claimed by them as being within the colony of Louisiana conveyed by, conveyed by such treaty. The president is saying that this was always Louisiana territory, American territory, it was part of the Louisiana Purchase. He sends in troops and basically seizes it. The local people are furious, but at the same time, they're getting what they wanted, it's just not the way they wanted it. Several people run back to their little fort, they hoist their flag of West Florida, declare war in the United States, then they start thinking about it. This might not be the smartest thing I've done this morning. So they decide to take the flag back down and accept the fact that they're now part of the United States. So that ends the 74th day of the Republic of West Florida. It's now part of the United States. But this whole controversy, the way this whole thing takes place, is gonna play again a critical role in Louisiana trying to become a state because they have real disputes over the territory. Just what is Louisiana? You know, it makes it a real issue. There we go. Oh, kind of jumping ahead, we'll just have to deal with it. So Madison annexed West Florida, it's a territory, and what happened is some in Congress argued that you can't do this because it's really Spanish territory. You couldn't recognize this rebellion. These are just a bunch of planters who took the local governor and threw him out the city. You know, that's not legitimate. This is Spanish territory. You can't just see Spanish territory. Congressman Troop of Bibba, Georgia, turned around and said, well, I can accept that, but it's not part of Louisiana, it's part of Mississippi. So now you've got an issue in Congress deciding where, where does West Florida belong? To whom does it belong? So it's getting mired in all sorts of politics. Basically then, as a consequence, it's gonna have an effect on everything. This thing is giving me a lot of trouble. Congressman Ray of Tennessee, 
felt really that it belonged to Louisiana and could not lawfully be given away. So now in Congress, you have people debating just exactly where West Florida is. Is it part of Spain? Is it part of Mississippi? Is it part of Louisiana? How can you bring a state into the Union when you don't know what's going on here? So they got to sort all these things out. It's at this point then, with all this mess in the background, that Louisiana begins the process of wanting to become a state. New Orleans remained a counterpoint to the rest of America. Newcomers recalled when they encountered the prevailing French language in the city, its dominant Catholicism, its bawdy sensual delights, its proud free black population, in short, its deeply rooted Creole traditions. Its incorporation to the United States posed a profound challenge. The infant republic's first attempt to impose its institutions on a foreign city. We are still a foreign city. Watch Treme. I've always been curious how the rest of the world looks at that and tries to figure it out. <laughs> That's by Clement Lassat, who was sent by Napoleon to be governor of Louisiana when he thought he was going to keep it. Other people, Kukla said controversies over race, religion, law, language, and culture not only delayed Louisiana statehood until 1812, they worked like the rumbling of an earthquake along the vulnerable fault lines of 19th century American society and government. This particularly relates to the free black population. Issues, basically, should additional states out of the territories be allowed into the Union? It's a serious question. Would not that diminish the power and influence of the existing states if they allow a state from this area to come in because it opens the door for so many more to come in? Did the Constitution even allow the acquisition of territory and the admission of new states? These are the issues that are coming up in Congress at this point. Could free black citizens of Louisiana be allowed to vote? That's an issue that the federal government had never talked about. This is probably the first time the federal government addresses the issue of suffrage and African Americans. How would French Louisiana concern issues about the British and French relations? This is critical because Louisiana is basically French at this point, even though it has been under Spanish control. America is trying desperately to stay out of the Napoleonic Wars. Bringing in as a state, a state that has heavily French and Spanish influence could change the whole balance of power simply because people in New England were pro-British. So this brought in another element along the way. What is the disposition of West Florida, who controlled it, and what is the western boundary anyway? So, I mean, there's a lot of questions. Are you sure you want to move forward with this? So, this is what it came down to. So, what happens is, in 1810, March 12th, it goes to the Senate. Normally, this is a process performed. You go to the Senate, the Senate passes it, you go to the House, the House passes it, you give it to the President, the President signs it. It's a done deal. Let's go on to more important affairs. Not with Louisiana. Giles of Virginia presents Senate a memorial for the territory of Louisiana. Senate accepts the petition and Orleans is ordered to draft a constitution. That's strictly perform a state government petition to admission. The bill passed the vote of 15 yay to 8 nay. Eight people are not happy with what's going on here. The first indication there may be a problem. April 28th, the bill is sent to the House of Representatives. Therein, problems arise. Julian Poydras, who's a representative, a Creole, presents a petition to the House based on the Treaty of Paris of 1803, which is a Louisiana Purchase, saying, according to this document, you have to bring Louisiana in, or you're repudiating the Louisiana Purchase. That's his legal argument. That's how he presents it. Mr. Macon of Georgia seeks admission to the territory of Orleans and West Florida. He's in agreement. Mr. Bibb of Georgia says, no, I don't think so. We're going to strike the provisions in West Florida. As a result, then they start fighting over statehood and their territories. Mr. Wheat of Massachusetts says the whole thing is unconstitutional and expedient. I don't think we should even be talking about this. As a result, oh, go back. Constitution never intended to include territory from Orleans who were foreigners and subject to foreign governments. That was a big concern. If we extend our limits at all without consent of the people further than expressed in the Constitution, think about this comment. Who can tell where we might ultimate bounds of the number of states may be in this union? Can you imagine if you talk to this guy today and said, you'll be 50 states, you'll be halfway across the Pacific, and you'll be in the Arctic Circle. The man would die. There's just absolutely no question about it. Okay, Bill. We shall also annex and lose our independence and become altogether subject to their control. Word about foreign control. Miller of Tennessee sympathized with those opposed to the un-American character of the population. 
For as much as we know if we send a patty to Paris, that's an Irishman, a derogatory term, a patty will come back. They are concerned with if you'd spend a Creole to Paris or to France, he's going to identify with French and, and Spanish traditions. He's not truly an American. That was the fundamental line there. Mr. Ray of Tennessee objected to any amendments because you can't do this because of the Article 3 of the Louisiana Purchase. Mr. Bibb of Georgia discussed, forget it, I don't even want to talk about statehood because Florida's part of Mississippi and I'm not going to accept Louisiana unless Florida is part of Mississippi. So now you talk about gridlock in Washington today, we experienced it back in 1812 as we're trying to get into the Union. Okay? This is the area that was in question, West Florida. This gentleman here, if I can get it back there, George Poindexter is a Mississippian from Natchez who was perhaps one of the leading advocates for Louisiana statehood and worked desperately to try to make it happen. It starts taking on a racial turn because of Louisiana's unique racial culture. We had at this time about 50% of the population was African American, a large percentage of those were slaves, but a significant portion were free people of color be reiterated, who also, some of them owned slaves and played a vital role in the economy. Mr. Miller of Tennessee proposed amendments restricting the right of suffrage to whites, white males, by the way, not ladies. Ladies don't get to vote for quite some time, because of his concern of a mixed population in the area. A person of color might find his way into Congress, and I had no inclination to work with such a member. So now you see where the issues are starting to break on racial lines. Point Dexter pointed out that a large number of these people are incredibly wealthy. They're very respectable. Who are you talking about? What are you talking about? Miller's Amendment passed 17. Nay's not recorded. White suffrage is only allowed. Free people of color now start realizing that things are going to change as Louisiana joins the Union. And they will discover that. They'll start leaving Louisiana. Some of them will go up north. Others will go with the ball places to Mexico and start so whole families will move because they start finding the freedoms that they had living in French and Spanish Louisiana are going to be eroded as the black codes that were part of the American system start being imposed in here in this area. Mr. Pitkin of Connecticut, I know this is a little bit tedious, but it just shows you how crazy this thing was. Undetermined western boundary of the territory of Orleans. Was it the Sabian River, the Rio Bravo, the Rio Grande, the Nacogdoches? Was it the Rio Hondo? I mean, where is your western boundary? How can you put something in that we don't even know what it is? Johnson of Tennessee took the issue with the principle should violate the admission of a territory as a state. So you can see all these members of Congress are picking this thing apart and trying to find reasons why Louisiana shouldn't come in. So basically, the question came down to boundaries, what it would be, and it was a persistent problem. Joshua Quincy of Massachusetts is a guy who becomes the lead point man for opposition to Louisiana. He also tried to impeach President Jefferson, but lost by 117 to 1, so I assume he was by himself on that one. I'm just curious how he got it seconded, if he was the only vote, but that's a separate issue there. When it comes down to a Quincy of Massachusetts violently opposed it, and even talked about Massachusetts seceding from the Union if Louisiana came in. I address you, Mr. Speaker, with an anxiety and distress of mind with me wholly unprecedented. To me, it appears that this measure would justify a revolution in the country. I am compelled to declare it as my deliberate opinion that if this bill passes, the bounds of this Union are virtually dissolved. That's some fiery speech. The Constitution is the political compact for which the original parties would be released if the assumed principle of this bill became law. Mississippi, Poindexter stood up and said, this is an act of treason to talk about secession. The House sustained him, but then the House vote of 56 to 40, 53 ruled against Poindexter. Quincy was now loose to say what he wanted to say. He then continued his attack. Whether the proprietors of the good old United States shall manage their own affairs their own way, or whether their constitutional political rights should be trampled underfoot by foreigners. That's what he's referring to us as a group of foreigners. We didn't belong in the Union. He then went on, he was delivering this conclusion that a virtual dissolution of the Union, that the free states make a moral obligation. If you read the thing, basically what he's saying is that the contract that holds America together is now null and void, given the opportunity that this state join the Union did not spring for the animosity of those seeking the protection of below Constitution, but for the deep conviction it contained a principle incompatible with the liberties and safeties of our country. 
Thursday, the issue arose over Western boundary again. He saw that war with Spain was not something to worry about. It'll be resolved. Then we advanced the notion that basically the, driven, the debate was driven by pro-British feelings. And there is an underlying of that because of the Napoleonic Wars. Remember, Louisiana gets into the Union just months before the War of 1812 explodes. Okay? You have two sides. You talk about a divided world. Half the people in the United States supported Great Britain, the other half supported France. You even had, after we declared war against Great Britain, what they called them blue lights in the Connecticut area that were informing the British of what the Americans were doing. The Annapolis Convention was called, which was going to secede New England from the Union if the War of 1812 persisted. So the idea of bringing in a French state was anathema to these people in New England. And as a result, that was one of the underlying reasons for their opposition. Okay? Tensions of polar water had now entered it. Finally, other states' fears, members feared the dissolution of their power. This thing goes on. Nick, I may need a hand here. I think I'm losing something. Got it? Oh, not too far. So anyway, just going on briefly, the bill of it passes the death blow to the Constitution, and so they go on. Gold of New York gets involved. This is really becoming a problem. Whether the empire should be bound by its existing limits to the shore of the Pacific Ocean, whether this would be a commonwealth of reasonable limits of a government of acquisition or conquest whose ambition to low limits and whose extension to regional states would be lost. This is an amazing comment when you sit down and think about it, because what he is fearful of is exactly what happened. We've become a continental power, but is that bad? But he was opposed to it because he saw that the power of his state was going to be diminished as time comes on. The issue comes to a vote. Basically, at this point, Quincy sought to kill a debate by postponing the bill, a technical error. It didn't work, 78 to 2. Louisiana statehood went to a final vote in the House of Representatives. It passes 77 to 36. This is basically the breakdown of the how it went, who voted who. So you can see New England opposed, middle states, far south, far west, far. That's where the problems were. Now it starts to go to the Senate. This is where it gets bounced back and forth. Louisiana receives the bill, Senate debate, struck out the amendment, giving the power of the territory east of the Mississippi. By 24 to 8, they averted a position. White males only could vote, okay? Senate to Dana, Connecticut, proposed a amendment preventing admission unless each state individually consented to it. Not the Congress, each state has to do it. This is in violation of the Article of 18, uh, Ordinance of 18, uh, 1787. So you see where it's getting all convoluted here. Senator Clay defeats those amendments. The bill passes by a vote of 22 to 10 with amendments. What are those amendments? Western boundary had to be set at the Sabine River, which is where it is. Mail votes only allowed. And yeah. it now goes back to the House. Let's see what it gets in. It goes to the House, rejects the mail vote. The white mail vote by 62 is 49, sent back to the Senate. The Senate reaffirms the idea of the voters being white, 17 to 8, goes back to the House. House gets the bill again, demands Louisiana the racial composition of voters, returns it to the Senate. <laughs> it's going back and forth like a volleyball. By 19, oh, by 19 to 1, the Senate refuses to alter from its position. So finally, it's returned to the House. And finally, the House again discusses the bills and decides, you know what? We give up. We'll let the state, the central government, decide on a racial division. Blacks will not have the right to vote in this issue. Let's just get this thing done. Louisiana statehood is finally approved. This is the first time that the federal government actually takes a stand on the issue of race and voting, as best I can see. The boundaries, what are you going to do? We're back to that mess. The West was the Sabine River, exactly how you're going to do it. Conflicts with Spain persisted over this area. That won't be resolved until 1819 when Andrew Jackson invades Florida. We end up buying Florida to get, stop that deal and then say, well, why don't you throw in the Sabine River while you're at it? Florida is not provided for at this time. The southern boundary is the Gulf of Mexico. Now Louisiana is done. It's finally got to draw its own constitutional convention. Sorry about this thing, it's really been a problem. 1811, they sit down and they meet. Now the question is, what are you going to call it? Some say we ought to call it Louisiana. Others said, no, why don't we call it Jefferson? Others said, we've got to keep the original name of Orleans. So they have a debate within a group here in Louisiana. They decide, let's go to the original name of Louisiana. 
They go to Louisiana, they adopt the Constitution, and then later on they add on, they annex the idea of West Florida. They pass the law saying that all other public lands that are not accounted for will be given to the federal government for distribution as territories, which is part and parcel of the normal process. At this point then, it is sent back to Congress again. You can imagine that. Finally, the House passes the bill 79 to 23 against. The Senate approves the bill, and the final thing gets to meet in conference committee on April 6, 1812. April 14th, President Madison finally signs it into law. Statehood. April 30th, they use the ninth anniversary of Louisiana Purchase as the basis for establishing the state of Louisiana. It becomes the 18th state of the Union. Four days later, West Florida is included up to the Pearl River. But that boundary hasn't been established. Anybody been out to the Pearl River? How many different tributaries they have out there? So when you say Pearl River, what do you mean by that? Now you've got a problem within a problem within a conundrum. So they decide how are we gonna handle this one? So finally they decided to throw West Florida in, and this then becomes the area that they're looking at. So they look at it and say, well, how are we going to handle it? Well, they handled it the only way people of that way decided. They went up here to the top here of the Pearl River. They got themselves an empty whiskey barrel, which I presume was full when they left. <laughs> Emptied the whiskey barrel, threw it in the Pearl River, and said, you know what? Wherever that barrel goes, we'll make that determine what the boundary is between Mississippi and Louisiana. And that's what happened. So you sit down and you've got this little area right there, and that became the boundary Whiskey Creek. You know, that's how it was established. It's kind of crazy how things happen. This then is what we now call the Florida Parishes, which you always hear on the weather reports. And from this point on, you now have the state of Louisiana. They've now established that the Florida boundary has been established here. And on this side here, they've got the Sabine River, so Louisiana as a state has been effectively worked out. Its territory boundaries are established. It's now a state of the Union. These are the parishes as they come back. They go back to 19 parishes. The idea of counties just never did work. So we're back to the parish concept. We have 19 parishes, and that then is the conclusion. So I know it's a little bit tedious. I apologize for that. But as you can see, Unlike other states in the Union that merely just met with Congress, passed a bill, went back, drafted a constitution, brought it to Congress, passed the House, passed the Senate, signed by the President, bingo, you're a state. Louisiana was caught in the turmoil of the Napoleonic Wars. It was caught in the construct of the confusion of the Louisiana Purchase, the legalities of the Louisiana Purchase, racial issues, dilution of power, the first state to come out of the original territory of the treaty that ended the American Revolution. There were so many issues involved in Louisiana. But once Louisiana was in, once Louisiana became a state of the Union, it made it easier for the states that followed to fall into the pattern because the precedent had been done. It was a painful birth, but it was a good one. Thank you. I just asked if anybody had any questions. I'll attempt to answer them. Yes, sir. Wasn't the Burr conspiracy with General Wilkinson also going on at the same time? Absolutely. I didn't want to get into that. This was crazy enough. <laughs> yeah, you see, because General Wilkinson is a story in and of himself. Because, I mean, he was, what, number two to George Washington, also the American Revolution, but I think he was agent 28 in the Spanish employ. So he was also paid by the Spanish government as, as a secret agent. So in a way, for Louisiana, it worked because General Wilkes is going to handle it. Well, he's paid by both sides. So all he did was, yeah, I'm making a no man's land, and that kind of settled the thing. But you're right, the Burr conspiracy was brewing at the same time. He was coming down the Mississippi River trying to stir up all sorts of support for himself. You know, because he was, by the way, a vice president of the United States who ended up being charged with treason. He's also the guy that shot Alexander Hamilton in the duel. Those are fun days. We thought politics was brutal today. At least we don't shoot each other. Anybody else out there? Yes, sir. Yeah, did this have anything to do with the War of 1812 with Britain? Uh, 
In a way, yes, because after we become a state of the union, within several months, the United States declares war. And a lot of people in Louisiana are like, what? <laughs> do I really want to join this club? But the interesting sidelight to that has a lot to do with when the British arrive in Louisiana, the first thing they tell the French and Spanish Creoles is that we are not declaring war on you, we're declaring war on the Americans. We will return you to your rightful leaders in Spain. So if you look at the War of 1812 and the battle out here in Chalmette, a lot of people don't realize how much was at stake. Had the British won, one of their intentions was to return the Louisiana Purchase back to Spain because it is stolen property. There's no getting around it. I mean, Napoleon never paid for it, he sold it. Try doing that with your car. You, know, you can't get away with it. You know, so you're right, it's, it's tied in directly. That's why the British thought they would have local support and were shocked when they didn't. Anyone else? That's one of them. Yes, sir. Now, this is the first time that I've been found that this was mentioned and is buried in this bill, so it's rather, it's, it's more interesting. It's actually, this is Dr. Berry and it brought it to my attention and mentioned it last time, and I've been digging into it a little bit, not as much as I guess as I should, but I can't find any other references to that. So actually, this is an amazing event where they actually have the Federal Congress making a stand on black suffrage as early as 1812. And a firm stand, I mean, the, the House, was in favor of letting the people in Louisiana make decisions for themselves. It was the Senate that was insistent. You saw how many times it was bounced and the Senate just refused to listen to it. We will only allow whites to vote. Now, if you don't accept it on that basis, you will not get our vote. So finally the House caved after the third try and said, all right, fine, we'll go with it. Let's just get the State of the Union and be done. But that sent a direct signal to the free black population of the city of New Orleans as to where, what their status was going to be and how they were going to be treated. It would be totally different than it was under the French and Spanish regimes. Yes, sir? Yes, ma'am? I'm sorry. Yes? It, it started with parishes under the Spanish. I think it was Governor O'Reilly established the parishes when he did a survey, a census, to see where everything was and established parishes. And under the Spanish, it's a marriage of government and, and religion, especially back then. Then in 1805, they established counties. And then in 1812, they went back to the parishes. So it's this little blip there where it takes place. But as you know, if you try to buy something off the internet, they ask what county you're from. You put parish, they think you're talking about your church. Yes. It's always difficult. Yes, yes ma'am. You know, I don't really know that. I should, but I don't. I know that it was part of Orleans as a, as a county, but the absolute date when it gained its, its independence, I know it had to be fairly early on, but I couldn't tell you when, because I know in the 1850s and 1830s, they were doing a lot of nuisance laws, and uh, St. Bernard Parish wasn't included. And if you remember back when they moved to Artois, which was the, uh, the, the um, Slaughterhouses. I think that was what 1870s. They moved. Them, they moved the boundary and made Saint Bernard bigger, so that they wouldn't have to move to slaughterhouses. But when it was actually established, it was pretty early back, I believe. If someone else has a response to that, I'd welcome it. But I really can't answer that directly. I wouldn't want to give you a, a wrong answer on that one. But I'll look it up. Yes. I think it was 1817. Yeah, probably. I know it was early, but I didn't want to give a date unless I was sure. So 1817. Two hundred eighteen seventeen. Of the actual parish, the boundary of establishing a parish. Yes, yeah, what I was saying. So, but I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Gail. Anyone else? Well, one. Yes, sir. From Maryland. Yeah, no, I don't have any quotes from that. I mean, if I did dig deeper into it, I'm sure you'd find something, because you're right, they're the only other Catholic region, that's Maryland after Queen Mary. 
you know, but uh, I don't have any quotes from that area. But I think a lot of times what it, what it broke on, religion was part of it, but I think the main thing was the fact that by adding states, they started realizing they were diluting their own power. And, you know, it's like joining a club. You know, you consider yourself a charter member of the club. You deserve better rights than anybody who comes in later. And the idea of bringing these people in on equal footing sounded all right in 1787, but my God, you know how much we got, how big this country's getting? And then the issue of buying property and adding on was something they never even countenanced, you know? So this was adding a whole new level. So it's like always, I think it goes down to power politics. Anything else? Well, I sure do appreciate it. I know it's a little tedious at times, but I'm afraid that's the way it was. <laughs> so thank you so much. Dr. Manning, he did a great job. We really appreciate what you've done here. 